they weren't taken seriously. They were considered, you know, fly-by-night vagabonds. That's one of the words used about them. Or fly-by-night hippies. You know, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. That's literally what they were told. That's the voice of journalist and author Elizabeth Becker. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Michelle, great to see you. I hope you had a terrific weekend. And what do you have lined up for us on Early Warning? Hey, Tom, and right back at you about the weekend. Today is all about policy impacts. We are looking at the recently introduced No First Use Act, which was introduced last week by Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Adam Smith. And then we're looking at President Biden's defense budget's effects on communities of color. So please tune in for today's early warning. And after that, I sit down with Elizabeth Becker. Uh, She's an award-winning journalist and author. And we talk about her new book that reveals the story of three extraordinary female journalists who were pioneers in covering the wars in Vietnam and Cambodia. Becker tells us how these women earned their spots on the front lines and in the process changed the way wars have been reported ever since. It's a great story of personal triumph and sacrifice that you won't want to miss. Finally, Tom answers a question about the different types of nuclear bombs on this week's Q&A. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at PressButtonPod or send us an email at PressTheButton at Plowshares.org. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps to grow our show and our audience, and we really do appreciate it. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning, a seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Today, I'm joined by Alan Hester, grassroots and policy coordinator for the Nuclear Weapons Abolition Program at Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Diana Olbum, senior strategist and legislative director for foreign policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Thank you both for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Alan, this past week, Senator Elizabeth Warren, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Representative Adam Smith, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, reintroduced the No First Use Act to establish in law that the United States policy is not to use nuclear weapons as a means of warfare first. What impact do you think this bill might have? So if you look at what President Biden's administration has stated in its interim national defense strategy, they've stated that when possible, they'll seek to reduce nuclear weapons in our national defense and security strategy. A no first use policy would offer the administration and Congress a chance to do just that. Um, Under the previous administration's 2018 nuclear posture review, the United States was willing to use nuclear weapons to respond to any attack that it deemed existential in nature. That included things like cyber attacks. Under that kind of posturing, it's no longer fair to say that the U.S. nuclear weapons are simply there to deter nuclear use on ourselves and our allies, which is often assumed to be the de facto model. But in truth, within that model, we're centering nuclear weapons as a central part of our national security strategy. And we're using the threat of first use as a catch-all for an array of potential threats. And this drastically increases the chance that nuclear weapons are used. So for the president, implementing a no first use policy would be an effective way for the administration to show its seriousness about wanting to change the role of nuclear weapons in our national security policy. And for Congress, I think no first use falls in line with a couple of broader national security recommendations that Chairman Smith has highlighted um, at a recent event at American Enterprise Institute. You know, first, Chairman Smith says the U.S. military needs to wake up to the fact that global dominance is no longer a viable strategy for national defense because pursuing that unrealizable goal is making the country less safe. 
Second, Chairman Smith also says that rather than seeking to dominate all of its adversaries, the U.S. military should look for ways to change the calculus of our adversaries. And the way that he phrases this is deterrence, not dominance. A no first use policy would more concretely, more concretely clarify that our existing nuclear weapons arsenal is meant only to deter nuclear weapons attacks on ourselves and our allies. And finally, Chairman Smith says, you've got to be more nimble, smarter, and more diversified in how you do your national security. So when it comes to nuclear weapons, it's not a good idea to overcommit ourselves to threatening nuclear first use as a catch-all. Tying ourselves to Cold War era thinking will likely not set us up for success when trying to prepare for new and emerging types of threats. So outside of D.C., what type of support do you see for this policy? I think that no first use is a great example of a policy that I would call common sense policy reform, because I think it's already shown that it can pick up support from a couple of different areas. And I'll give a couple examples of that. First, our friends at Rethink Media have done polling to show that an overwhelming majority of Americans believe that the U.S. nuclear arsenal is only for deterrence purposes. And that's somewhere in the realm of 92 percent of Democrats and 88 percent of Republicans. Second, local grassroots campaigns like the Back from the Brink campaign, for example, have shown that when citizens approach their local legislators, mayors, city halls with resolutions that support no first use, they get them passed because local leaders understand that if Washington were to suddenly use nuclear weapons first, their citizens could pay the price of retaliation from an adversary. And finally, I think more anecdotally, when I'm explaining this issue to people outside of the disarmament space, the most common response we hear is, isn't that our policy already? I think it's reflective of the polling that I mentioned earlier that most Americans already see our arsenal's sole purpose for deterring a nuclear attack on ourselves and our allies, despite whatever strategic ambiguity type thinking is coming out of Washington. Thanks, Alan. Diana, this past week, you published a piece in Defense One making the case that the defense budget in the recent Biden administration's request, quote, cannot be exempt from the scrutiny of its effects on communities of color. When you apply a racial equity lens to the defense budget, what do you find? Thank you so much for this question, Michelle. I think you find that these extravagant Pentagon spending levels cause significant and disproportionate harms to Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other people of color, both here at home and around the world. And I see those harms falling into four areas. The first is that endless Pentagon spending enables endless wars that are mostly fought against black and brown people in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Niger, Somalia, and the Philippines. We've engaged in combat in 19 countries since 2001. And we currently have militarized counter-terror activities in 85 countries. The second harms are the toll that these wars extract here at home that falls most heavily on communities of color. Whether you're talking about the impacts of climate change, and the Pentagon is one of the world's top greenhouse gas emitters, uh, or radiation exposure from uranium mining and nuclear spills, or the 1033 program that transfers military grade equipment to local police forces. All of these cause disproportionate harm to Native Americans and to people who are Black and Latinx. The third area is of harm is that in order to justify all these huge defense budgets, our policymakers and military planners tend to demonize China, Iran, North Korea, and this exacerbates anti-Asian and anti-Muslim sentiment here in the U.S. And that works the other way around, too. Racism at home is driving our ability to dehumanize people in other countries and allow us to impose these punitive sanctions and threaten nuclear war against these countries. And finally, there's the question of trade-offs. All this money we're spending on the Pentagon is money that's not being spent on human needs and on things that are really a much greater risk to the lives, particularly of people of color. It's a choice to spend less money on healthcare, education, clean energy, and jobs. The myth that we need to spend $753 billion each year on the Pentagon is used as an excuse not to address racial, climate, and economic justice. 
You write that, quote, Americans can no longer pretend that the size of the Pentagon budget is a measure of national security or that spending more on the military will keep us safer. So what would keep us safer? You know, this is such an important question, because when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. There just are no military solutions to most of the problems and challenges that face us. What will keep us safer is building a fair and equitable multiracial democracy at home where Black people don't have to worry every day about dying at the hands of police because of some minor infraction or for no reason at all. You know, we've also had over 570,000 deaths in the United States from COVID-19, which is more than the number of Americans who died in World War II, and it's approaching the number who died in all the wars, World War I, II, Korea, and Vietnam all put together. Yet most of these deaths were totally unnecessary and could have been prevented if we'd only taken some of the same precautions that other nations like Australia had taken. So what would keep us safer around the world is to ramp up our diplomacy and our development cooperation. We can use non-military tools to fight terrorism, such as international legal cooperation, shutting down anonymous shell companies and the black markets for arms trade. But there are also things we need to stop doing. We have to end our endless wars and the quest for global military domination. We should wind down our 800 bases in 80 countries that only make us more of a target. We need to start ratifying and complying with the treaties that the whole rest of the world has signed and already agreed to. When we hold ourselves accountable to the same rules we demand of other countries, we make all people safer. And that's really the important thing to remember. We can't make ourselves more safe by making other people less safe. Diana, Alan, thank you so much for joining and putting such powerful messages into such a short period of time. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner and I'm the Managing Director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, Your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. We have a very special guest today. Elizabeth Becker is an award-winning journalist and author who has reported on national security for the Washington Post, NPR, and the New York Times, among others. I had the honor of working with Elizabeth 20 years ago when she was covering missile defense for the New York Times. What I did not know then was that Elizabeth got her start in Cambodia as one of the first female reporters covering the Vietnam War. She wrote about that experience in her first book, When the War Was Over, Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge Revolution. She has just written a new book, this one a fascinating look at what it was like for her and other female reporters covering Vietnam. It's called You Don't Belong Here, and I think the title says it all. Elizabeth, it's great to have you here. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. The book, as I said, called You Don't Belong Here, it's subtitled How Three Women Rewrote the Story of War. What is so compelling about this book to me is that you describe the experiences of these three amazing women and you weave three big themes together. 
uh, one, the tragedy of war. And in this case, you know, the huge mistake and unmitigated disaster that was Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, and then the experience of women, including you, covering the war and how hard it was to be a pioneer in the situation. Uh, and lastly, how female reporters changed the way war itself was reported and how the war changed the women reporting it. And as you write in the book, no one knew what it had meant to be a woman covering the Vietnam War. And that is the story you set out to tell uh, and you do it very well. So let's start with the big picture. You were there for the end of the war, 1973 to 75. Vietnam and Cambodia have cast such huge shadows across US history since then. Looking back, what are the lessons from that experience that we should keep in mind today? There are so many lessons, but the one I always like to underline is that the military can only fight. It cannot bring democracy. The military cannot be diplomatic. The military should be the last answer. And Vietnam is the classic example of sending the military to do things the military should not be meant to do. The mission kept changing because they couldn't do it. And from changing the description of the war, which was truly stepping in for the French in a colonial war and transferring that and making up, this is now a Cold War war of democracy versus communism. False advertising there. Of course, the military couldn't resolve that. Bringing democracy to a very corrupt, non-democratic government? No. And this was also a civil war, Vietnamese versus Vietnamese. I, I could go on and on, but the thing is, change those budgets. The military budget does not need all that money. The diplomatic budget needs that money. Look at the government. The government has become warped to solve international problems solely through military. And that's, that's not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. You write that before Vietnam, women were barred from the battlefield, uh, either as fighters or reporters. And you tell the story of three women, Kate Webb, Catherine Leroy, and Frances Fitzgerald, who I'll just note uh, for our listeners may be familiar with one of her books, Way Out There in the Blue, Reagan, Star Wars, and the End of the Cold War that she wrote in 2000. These women set out to change the rules, and they all went on to have successful careers. How did they change the rules and why? Well, first of all, they didn't really think they were changing the rules. And that's really important. None of us thought we were changing the rules. Because as you know, when you grow up, most of those rules are never delineated. However, this was a rule that during World War II and perhaps before that, that women reporters could not be on the battlefield. Women reporters had to be back with the nurses. So uh, everybody knows who Martha Gellhorn is. She's a great reporter and everybody remembers she managed to get on the beach of Normandy during D-Day. She was not allowed as a woman. So she had to figure out how to get on the beach from the nurses in a ship. She never really covered the combat of the American army during World War II, but that's what she's remembered for. She did a great job in Spain and so on and so forth. But so when the women show up in Vietnam, one, they're not staff members of any newspaper or news organization because women were not considered fit for it. They were literally told they didn't belong there. So all of these women that you just mentioned, they bought a ticket on their own to Vietnam. They arrived without a job. They arrived without health insurance, without equipment, nothing. And they had to then scramble to find freelance work, which is what they did. So they started out not knowing that they were forbidden to go on the battlefield and without many resources. There is no editor back in the United States cheering them on and telling them what they wanted. They had to do it all on their own. Now, the reason they were able to evade that rule was because President Lyndon Johnson, who ordered the Americans to fully engage in war, he did not want to declare a war. So the old rules were not imposed. It was the most open war for journalism before or since. There was no embedding, nothing. All the journalists had to do were the journalists had to get their credentials and then 
ask a commander if they could follow the troops, albeit getting a ride on a helicopter, on a tank, jeep, whatever. And through this hole, the women naturally slipped. They found their way. And they really did not know that they were breaking some rules set back in Washington until General Westmoreland, head of all of American um, military in Vietnam, happened to see a young woman with a unit early in the war, a woman named Denby Fawcett. She was from Hawaii. And as it happens, her mother played tennis with General Westmoreland's wife. You cannot make this stuff up. And General Westmoreland said, Denby, what are you doing here? How long have you been here? And she said she's reporting on this unit and she'd been there a few nights and she would stay until they'd finished their mission. He said, oh, that's interesting. And he went back to Saigon and said, what is this? Women on the battlefield? They're not supposed to be on the battlefield. I had no idea because there are so few of them. So um, he said, they cannot do this. We can't have women on the battlefield. So the civilian side of the military, the Pentagon, listened to the women when they said, can you just not impose it? We're not asking you to get rid of it. Just don't impose it. We promise not to be a problem. We promise not to ask for anything special. Just don't impose it. And we won't say, they did not say a word to anybody. And this is how they're distinguished from modern journalists. They effectively ended the ban on women because it was never reimposed for the rest of so far. But they did not say, yay, we just won something for women's lip. They kept it quiet. And they did not tell their story for 30 years. They were so afraid that um, the big shots back in Washington would reimpose the ban, would do something horrible. And they felt so privileged to be able to cover this most important story. They knew there were so few women. It was like a mission or a vocation that, um, that everybody kept quiet. Nobody was tooting their own horn. So that's one of the reasons you hadn't heard of it. And of course, your book is, is the first time this story is told. They were doing this, trying to get on the battlefield in Vietnam because this was the story, right? This was a way for them to start their careers to cover the real issues. Is that right? Well, career is a, is a big word right now for these women because there was no career. I mean, they arrived with zero, this side of zero resumes. And, and the few that had even had any journalism experience, it wasn't much. Women at this stage of journalism were mostly assigned to the women's section, what was known as the pink ghetto. And they covered food, fashion, furniture, and family, the four Fs. This was before women had filed their lawsuits before women had started to cover something beyond the women's section. So start their career, yeah, but did they think they were gonna have a career? Not necessarily. So this is their way to do something that mattered, to have meaning in their life. And if you remember when you were in your twenties, that's what you wanted. You wanted to have meaning in their life. And I would say they were propelled more by that than anything else. Got it. Part of the story that that comes through so clearly in the book is how utterly exhausting it was to be a female reporter in the war and the amazing fortitude uh, of the women you write about. What made the experience particularly difficult for women? Well, on the professional side, um, they weren't taken seriously. They were considered, you know, fly by night vagabonds. That's one of the words used about them or fly by night hippies. You know, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. That's literally what they were told. As I said, they came without jobs. They came out without real resumes. They had to prove themselves in the face of open rejection. Kate Webb was told by United Press International, why would I hire a woman? Frances Fitzgerald was told by Newsweek, women are only qualified to be researchers, not to be reporters. And Catherine Leroy had it worse. When she started taking photographs, totally unchanged, with one like a camera. She was coming up with great photographs. She was actually doing well. She was selling them through the good offices of Horst Foss. And her, um, her colleagues, her male colleagues on the field were furious. And they thought this young woman, mid-20s, barely five feet tall, barely 90 pounds, she did not belong there. So they went behind her back and conspired with the American military established in Saigon to take away her credentials. Now, taking away her credentials means she would 
not be able to work and she'd have to go back to, to France. So um, they did that, but it was only temporary because Horse Foss and others came to her rescue and she, she fought back. So you had the passive not taking you seriously and the aggressive actively um, trying to throw a monkey wrench in your career. I should point out that Katrina is French, Francis Fitzgerald is American, and Kate Webb is Australian. So you have three very different cultures that I think very important viewpoints. Katrina's French. She knew the colonial history. She lived that. Kate's Australian, and Australia is the only country besides South Korea that was sent its troops to fight with the Americans in Vietnam. And of course, Francis is, is American. So they brought three very different cultures and very different backgrounds, but they have the same crummy treatment. Now, personal side, that's almost every day of um, men looking at them more for whether or not they were going to bed them or not, and some being more aggressive than others. There was definitely slut shaming, particularly with Katrine. All three of them very purposely did not support women's liberation, which was at the, its beginning, because that would open up a whole nest of, of ugliness with the men. It was a very hostile at times and, and often just simply annoying and uncomfortable. And then there were not a lot of women, so you could have women friends. All of the women who I talked to, there's a strong sense of loneliness. And of course, all of that was on top of the uh, usual rigors of covering a war. Which is 24-7. You, you live war. There's no assignment like it. There's no, when you're covering a war, everything you do informs you and you never feel like you have the full story. And you keep writing and writing and writing or taking photographs. And of course, it's dangerous. Indeed it is. And it, and it was. To me, one of the most interesting parts of the book is how, uh, and you tell this part very well, how having women report on the war changed the way the war itself was reported. Tell us about that. Right. Well, I think I've described how these women were outsiders. I've described how in their own countries, they were considered not suitable for journalism. So they arrived without the training that the average reporter had had. So they had to make it up as they, they went along. And that turned out to be the key. As I said, the three very different women with three very different skill sets. Frances Fitzgerald came from a patrician, wealthy American family. She grew up understanding the elite. Her father was number three at the CIA. So when she came to Saigon, even though her colleagues and the embassy didn't take her seriously, she also was not naive. She understood what the elite was like. So she did not in any time believe the five o'clock follies, the daily news briefing. Right from the get-go, she said, this is not what it's about. And so she made the, the radical decision that she was going to cover the country, the culture, the people, the landscape, the damage, to see the whole picture of the war and not concentrate so much on the battlefield and what was being said by the officials back in Saigon. So she opened up a whole new way of looking at the war. It's the way people look at it now. But I read what other people were writing, and she definitely was a pioneer in that a broader look. And that's one of the reasons why later, when she left Vietnam and went back to the United States, she spent several years researching and then writing Fire in the Lake. The first book that looked at the war from the Vietnamese as well as the American perspective, and it won all the major awards, Pulitzer, National Book Award, Bancroft History Award, and no book has done better since or before, the most highly um, rated. Uh, the establishment didn't like it. They said it was sort of like um, too anti-war for them, but um, it holds up. And it was published the same year as David Halberstam published his book, Best and the Brightest. And her colleagues were furious that she beat him out of all those awards, which they thought he deserved. So that's what you put up with. It struck me as well that the photography was different than the photography before. What would you say to right. that? Well, um, 
Katrina, just like Frances Fitzgerald, Katrina had no experience. She couldn't stand academics, so she quit high school. She never got a baccalaureate. But she had a keen emotional and um, imagination as well. And she decided right from the get-go that the way to really portray the war was to get close to the eyes, whether it's the eyes of the soldiers, the eyes of the refugees, the villagers fleeing the damage, which makes sense, but in war, it's crazy. So she took these amazing of the moment photographs. There's not heroics and all that and, you know, photographs that look posed. She captured it all, the anguish, the fear. She has a series of, of soldiers, you know, when they get their mail or when the chaplain comes, uh, just, or just lazing around, but also on the battlefield. And she took a series of a medic trying to save the life of a soldier right in the middle of a battle. And so she's crawling up this muddy hill and the guy doesn't even see her. She just takes click, 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 click. He tries to revive. You see the intention. He realizes the soldier's dead. You see the anguish. Then you see the anger as he tries to go kill the enemy who just killed the soldier. And it was extraordinary. It was, they were printed all over the place. And Voss said, I've, I haven't seen pictures like this since World War II. So she made the artistic decision and lived out in the field with the soldiers to a degree that few others ever did. And that's reflected in her photographs. And that, again, that's now taken for granted that that's what you do. And of course, as, as you implied, that kind of photography was tremendously dangerous. Very dangerous. And she was um, very badly injured. Her camera saved her. And, you know, the, which is one of those stories that, you know, every 10 injury of a photographer, the, the camera saves them. And fortunately, she was able to be transported to a hospital ship. And she was visited by a, a senior commander who said, I can't give you a purple heart, but here's a manicure set. <laughs> which a lot of women have noted from the book. <laughs> Unbelievable. And Kate, Kate was the Australian woman. She was an honors graduate in philosophy. And she turned out to be one of the best combat reporters of the whole war. Again, as far as I can tell, she was the first woman who regularly covered the American military in a war situation. And she was so good, she was made bureau chief in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, in the middle of some of the most dangerous fighting. Again, I don't know of another woman who did that. She and Katrine both suffered their whole life from PTSD, from all of what they saw. And Kate um, Webb, the Australian, was captured by the North Vietnamese in Cambodia. And by then, her byline had become distinctive. Kate Webb, a woman riding combat out of Vietnam and Cambodia. There, there's no other woman who, who wrote that. There's none other for the, all those years. And so when she was captured, it was a big deal. She was falsely declared dead when a corpse of a, a woman was found. But after almost a month, about three weeks, she was released. So it was like coming back from the dead. It was a resurrection. The New York Times had already written her obituary. One of the reasons she was so good is that she burrowed into the cultures of the Vietnamese and the Cambodians. She didn't just cover the Americans. She covered the, the armies that were supposed to be winning the wars. And she had an intelligence about it that was missing in some, and humanity about it that was missing in a lot of um, the dispatches. And you're segueing very well into my uh, last question, which is, as these pioneers, as you so well described it, changed the nature of war reporting, the war changed them. And you, as you write in the book, nothing in my short life ever mattered as much as witnessing Cambodia's war as a reporter. Every part of every day had meaning. I never felt more involved, more alive, or more vulnerable. I had crossed a line and made a commitment to Cambodia that would be costly. How did the war change you and your colleagues? First, I want to say that I wrote that in retrospect because um, I had no idea how costly it was going to be. And I cannot exaggerate how much we didn't know how 
this was day to day. Um, how did it change you? Well, um, it, it just it changed all of us that before we were you know, nunucks back in our own country. And then all of a sudden we became reporters who got to delve deeply into the most unsettling part of life, which also had remarkable moments of joy and exhilaration. And I think if you talk to any raw reporter, male or female, they'll say there's nothing like it. I mean, that's why there, there are um, reporters who only do war. Um, costly, uh, I left and never covered another war per se. I covered the Pentagon, that's when I met you, but I did not go out and cover a war. I turned down the New York Times when they asked me to go to the disastrous 2003 Iraq invasion. But when you see a country that you come to love, and, you, and I think all of us came to love Indochina, um, when you see it fall apart and then during a war, it's, we know what a personal loss is when our relatives and friends die. It's a different level of loss when a country is dying. And all of the three women, I mean, my goodness, um, they came in 66 and 67, and all three were back for the very end of the war in 1975. Frances Fitzgerald had a visa, a rare visa to Hanoi. So she was there in January of 1975, just as the North Vietnamese were beginning their final offensive. Kate was in Hong Kong and she talked her bosses into letting her go to cover the evacuation. So in March, April, she was on the ships off the coast of Vietnam and she was on the lead command ship, the USS Blue Ridge, and literally covered for, as the lead pool reporter, covered the US ambassador when he landed on the helicopter, when the CIA had landed on the helicopter. So she covered that side of it, the end of the Americans. And then Katrine came and she went to Saigon and she refused to be evacuated. And she stayed till the very end and photographed the North Vietnamese coming and breaking through the gates and taking over the presidential palace in Saigon. That's commitment. So that's how the, and they continued. They were, they were in the business for the rest of their lives. And Frankie's the only one who, Francis Fitzgerald is the only one who's still alive. The other two died in, in their early 60s of cancer. We are out of time, but for our listeners, the book is called, again, You Don't Belong Here, How Three Women Rewrote the Story of War. Elizabeth Becker, thank you so much for writing this book, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Tom, for inviting me. I enjoyed it very much. And now for my favorite nuclear Q&A. Are you ready, Tom? Bring it on, Michelle. This week's question comes from Jake from Richmond, California. Jake asks, what is the difference between an atom bomb, hydrogen bomb, plutonium bomb, uranium bomb, and nuclear bomb, etc.? Are there other related names for these? Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Jake from Richmond, California. Uh, that's a lot of different terms for a lot of different versions of the same thing. Those are all categories of atomic or nuclear bombs, which we define as bombs where the power comes from energy released by the nucleus of the atom. So nuclear or atomic bombs are, are pretty much the same. Uh, then you can split those down into fission bombs. They get their power by splitting atoms. And the first bombs had yields of about 15 kilotons, for example, the Hiroshima bomb, or about 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent, uh, TNT being a conventional explosive. Uh, then when you go up the power chain, you get to fusion bombs, also known as hydrogen or thermonuclear bombs. Uh, these use a fission bomb to start a reaction where the atoms fuse together and release energy, hence fusion. These bombs release a lot more energy, about 100 times or more energy than fission bombs. And all of the weapons in our arsenal today are hydrogen bombs, and they're all uh, in the range of, of hundreds of kilotons generally. Then there's two different types of material that we tend to make nuclear bombs out of, plutonium and uranium. The Hiroshima bomb 
was a uranium bomb. The Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb. Uranium bombs are judged to be easier to make. And in fact, the Hiroshima bomb was used without uh, a full-scale test. So we tend to be more worried about states building bombs without testing with uranium than plutonium. But Michelle, I'd ask, do you have anything you want to add to that uh, laundry list of nuclear weapons? Uh, it's a it's a really comprehensive list. I think the only thing I would add is that plutonium is not something that you mine out of the earth, right? It's actually produced in a nuclear reactor. And this is what gets at the heart of some of the non-proliferation issues is that the same tools that you use to make nuclear energy are really important parts of those that you use to make nuclear bombs. And a lot of our job comes down to figuring out which one's being used for which. Well said. Well, another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, Jake, for the question. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Will Lowry, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.